Hey everyone, welcome back to Keto and Crime and Thought Crime. Today we've got part three of Evil or Killer Kids, however you want to, however you want to categorize that. Today we're going to start off with a case that basically, with the exception of the O.J. Simpson trial and a couple of others, like the disappearance of Adam Walsh, a few others, dominated television and pop culture for years. We're talking about the Menendez brothers. Now. And Eric Menendez convicted of murdering their parents inside the family's Beverly Hills mansion in 1989. I was just firing as I went into the room. I just started firing. Claiming it was an act of desperation after years of sexual abuse by their father. But the prosecution arguing it was a plot to gain their parents' fortune. Vile and Eric Menendez have been found guilty of murdering their parents. Now, Yes, I know technically they were both adults when the crime occurred, but the background of what they did goes way back to their childhood. So that's the reason we're going to look at this, because I think as we delve into this, we're going to discover that perhaps they didn't mature beyond a certain age. And it's why I can lump them in to evil kids. And if there's time in this episode, we'll go into another case. But then we also have part four where we're going to cover a Canadian case and an American case as well. I found once once I delve into this that there's a lot. I, I really felt that the good old USA would top the list as far as having the number of people represented on this list. But what I found, it's kind of an even division between the U.S., Canada, the U.K., even some other countries all have their own amount of killer kids. So I was glad that the USA did not win this particular contest, as I anticipated that, that it would. So, for the most part, I think this is going to be an enjoyable, enjoyable change from the previous two episodes, which were very young children, and I think that's kind of hard to digest on the psyche. So that the fact that these two were actually adults when they committed their crimes... I think uh, will be a nice mental break from that. So, with that being said, let me give a shout out to my patrons and my channel members. Thank you so much. I could not uh, continue to do what I do without your help. Could not continue to improve the channel. I will always do this because I enjoy it, but I could not um, afford to do the upgrades that I've done. And I've got the new backgrounds coming. Like I said, just got to get my wife to put them together for me. And uh, we'll have some nice new backgrounds, uh, perhaps a new mic's coming, anything that I can do to improve the channel. So I might even hire an editor to help me with the edits because I'm not that great at it. I think I've improved, but not that great at it. But anyway, thank you so much for everything that you do. And if you'd like to join them, those links are below. You can also subscribe. That's the best thing you can do for the channel. Share, comment, even an emoji helps to get me into the YouTube algorithm. I have a goal of growing this channel to 10,000 subscribers by the end of this year. I think it's very doable, and uh, I, I need your help to do that. So, with that being said, let's delve into today's first case, the Menendez Brothers. <music> The Menendez brothers, as we know them, most commonly, we kind of lump them together into one almost unifigure, but they're actually, of course, two different, two brothers of the same married couple, Joseph Lyle Menendez, born January 10th, 1968, and Eric Galen Menendez, born November 27th, 1970. They are very solidly in Generation X, which I think is why I have such a huge effect huge interest in this case. I'm Gen X. Gen X is the generation born between, roughly, depending on what chart you're looking at, 1965 to 1980. That's Gen X. They are kind of that lost generation between baby boomers and millennials. And if you were kind of the middle child of the American generational system. And what I mean by saying that, if you look at any of 
the memes about generations that go around. It's always baby boomers versus millennials and now Gen Z to a certain extent, but Gen X tends to get forgotten. So we are that very short 15 year generation between the baby boomers and the millennials. We are also the, usually the parents of Gen Z and our parents are either baby boomers or traditionalists or lost gener or silent generation, the generation before boomers. So we are kind of that tucked right in there and we're defined by a couple of different things and this is important to this case we're defined by having a sense of independence and in that we were the first widespread generation of latchkey kids most of our parents worked both two parents this is when we entered into the realm of you having to have two working parents to make it as a middle class in the united states i could do a whole video just on that but we generally got ourselves off to school in the morning either by getting on the bus or walking or having an older sibling drive us or and we also got ourselves home in the afternoon unlocked a house by virtue of a latch key we wore around our necks and we were home sometimes for me until about 10 o'clock at night because i had parents that worked two jobs first and second shift so often i was at home alone until after 10 o'clock at night and I would, like a lot of latchkey kids, I was home for the first few hours. I did my own homework. I usually got my own dinner. I put myself to bed. So that's how we were defined. And I think for the most part, these, these two were products of that generation. We also tend to be kind of nihilistic. Uh, we were called X, A, because of the alphabet, but also because they didn't really know what we were going to be about. Boomers were about prosperity. Millennials are about technology. We're in there where we're not exactly sure what we're about. Uh, so therefore X, they didn't know quite how to define us. And uh, we also tend to be very nihilistic uh, because we did kind of take care of ourselves to a certain extent. We are not a very religious uh, generation and we tend to... Uh, not be very spiritual or into a drastical meaning of life so we're very nihilistic in our worldview so i think that's why this case was kind of a defining case for gen x and i think that's why it's such of such interest to me so i apologize for that background of gen x i'm going to do a video comparing the generations i'm working on it now but i'm doing animation so it's taken me a while but i will have that out for you soon but let's talk about joseph and eric menendez or Lyle, as Joseph is better known. But first, we have to start with their parents. First, the father. Their father, Jose Enrique Menendez, was born May 6, 1944, in Havana, Cuba. At the age of 16, his parents, in order to protect him from the ongoing revolution in Cuba, this is Fidel Castro, the, during that, they actually sent him to live with relatives in uh, just outside of Chicago in, uh, in Illinois. And uh, they did this for two reasons, to protect him, and also they wanted to stay behind to protect what property and possessions they had from takeover by the communists. So everybody talks about a glorious revolution in Cuba. It wasn't so glorious to those that actually lived through it. You had the same with China. You had the government literally killing people, imprisoning people, and taking the possessions they had worked for their entire life. So the Menendez brothers' grandparents stayed in Cuba to try to protect what little bit they had, but sent their son, uh, Jose, to the United States for a better life. And you'll have to excuse me, uh, we've had a lot of uh, severe storms in the area in the last few days, and it's kicked up a lot of allergens, so my allergies are going crazy. So if you see me doing Nothing's happening. I'm just got something in my eye. But anyway, so he grew up pretty much on his own in uh, Illinois. And he eventually, after his parents eventually did get here and they established their businesses here, he did attend uh, Southern Illinois University where he met his future wife, Mary Louise Kitty Anderson. Uh, they married in 1963 and moved to New York City, where Jose pursued an advanced degree in accounting from Queens College. It was in uh, 
in the New York City area, actually, where they, when they lived in uh, New Jersey, was born in 1968. And it was after his birth that Kitty realized that uh, Jose could support the family just fine with his accounting job and quit her job as a teacher and went, went home to be a stay-at-home mom. And then they later moved from New York City to Gloucester Township, New Jersey, and it was there in 1920, in uh, 1970, November 27th, 1970, that their younger son, Eric Menendez, was born. Uh, from the first, the two brothers had a very privileged upbringing. Not only did their father make enough money for them to have a very rare stay-at-home situation for a Gen X, a couple of Gen X kids, they also attended the finest private schools the state of New Jersey had to offer in the form of the Princeton Day School. Now, this is a school that is, of course, affiliated with Princeton University. It is considered a funnel system into the Ivy League, and both of them attended both junior high and high school at this school. Until 1986, when Jose got a job offer in Los Angeles, California, and he moved them to Beverly. Beverly Hills, that is. And both of them were then uh, enrolled in the famous Beverly Hills High School. Yes, the one portrayed on 90210. For those of us that are Gen X, we grew up with that show. So yes, that's where they attended school. And Jose, Jose was very driven for his sons as well. He was not going to accept anything but stel stellarship, you know, outstanding achievement in either of his sons, both academically and athletically so he forced them to not only try to take all the advanced courses but also to excel at a sport namely tennis where he basically pushed both of his sons in fact they did do quite well as at tennis ranking in the top 44 players high school players in the united states uh, and he also had dreams of them continuing to funnel into the ivy league system. Lyle had a bit better grades than younger brother Eric. Eric was the better tennis player, but Lyle was the better academic, and as a result, he did, also thanks to Jose's uh, connections, because Jose went on to be one of the founders of the company known as Live Entertainment, which is part of Artisan Entertainment, which is produces movies by uh, Quentin Tarantino. It produced The Blair Witch Project. A lot of well-known films came out of Artisan Entertainment and Live Entertainment, which also produced live events. And uh, Jose was one of the most integral executives in this company. He, he had owned his own accounting firm in New York, but by virtue of his great prowess with investments and taxation, he was offered a job by Artisan Entertainment uh, just a couple of years before his death, and that led to the family's move to Los Angeles. And so as a result, the family became quite wealthy. And he also, this fueled his need to have his sons be as successful as he is, and eventually older son, Lyle, did enroll at Princeton University. However, unlike his father, who was a great academic as well as soccer player, athlete. Lyle did not do so well at Princeton. Uh, he was put on academics probation uh, by the end of his freshman year and was actually suspended his sophomore year for suspicion of plagiarism. But if you don't know, that's where you pass off somebody else's work as your own. As a result of this, it put him at odds with, uh, it put Lyle very much at odds with his very a personality father. And uh, the father not only threatened to remove all of his financial support, but also uh, threatened to cut him off completely if he didn't shape up his act. While young Eric had just finished high school, or was about to finish high school at the time of his parents' death, uh, he was also kind of on a um, thin ice with his parents because, as I said, he did excel at tennis, but was not excelling in his grades. So let's just say that both of the boys were being hammered with threats of having their financial support cut off if they didn't shape up their act. And all this culminated in what happened on August 20th, 1989 at their Beverly Hills home. That night, a 911 call came into LA County 911 in which 
Lyle Menendez said, someone killed my parents. And, of course, officers were immediately dispatched to the Beverly Hills home where they found a deceased Jose and Kitty Menendez. Jose had been shot in the back of the head with a 12-gauge shotgun, while Kitty, it looked as though she had actually tried to run from whoever the assailants were, got up, slipped in both Jose's blood and her own blood as she was shot in the leg while trying to run down the hallway and was killed by several gunshots to the arm, chest, and face, leaving her almost unrecognizable. Um, both of the, both Jose and Kitty also appear to have been shot in the kneecaps and to almost signify that perhaps this had been some sort of punishment for crimes rendered. Um, of course, the uh, Beverly Hills Police Department did question both Lyle and Eric Menendez and they both said they had been to the Taste of LA Food Festival at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium that was going on that weekend, as well as had gone to a movie theater to see Batman, and they did produce tickets to show just that. So, for some reason, the police did not put them through any other battery of tests, such as a DNA, a DNA swab, or even a gun residue test. And I think this is a testament to how things have changed because if you remember us talking about the Jordan Brown case they put this little kid through this entire battery of tests looking for all this stuff an 11 year old but did not do the same for two men over the age of 19 in which their parents had just been murdered it, I think it just shows the differences in how different social statuses are treated in our country I hate to be that way but it's true I think, you know, that they, they were of Latino descent. So I think this is, it's less about race sometimes, and it's more about money. If you have money, you can get away with more things. That's just, just how it is. And I think this case is extremely indicative of that fact. So, because none of these tests were done, there was a lack of evidence to pursue any sort of investigation against the two brothers. And so, basically, what had happened was they basically started looking into possible mob connections because the the two victims had their kneecaps blasted and this looked like perhaps a mob punishment mob type execution both boys in their interrogation said that they suspected their father had ties to organized crime because of his immense wealth and his ties to the entertainment industry and as a result for at least four years these boys were free to live their life unvented and boy did they they of course got all their parents life insurance they inherited the house they inherited all their parents possessions and lyle himself was of course the most the oldest boy was the most lavish when it came to spending he immediately brought bought a rolex watch he bought a porsche camera uh, porsche carrera he bought a restaurant a literal like hot wings restaurant in princeton new jersey called chuck's spring street cafe i mean okay a car i get maybe a watch but a restaurant in a state that you don't even live in dude uh they eventually both though moved out of their parents mansion in beverly hills and ended up buying adjoining condo townhouses in Marina del Rey, California, and they also, one of them, Eric, the youngest, drove around Los Angeles in their deceased father's Mercedes-Benz convertible. They spent a ton of money. They went on overseas trips. They ate at the finest restaurants. They carried women out on lavish dates. They took cruises to the Caribbean and to Europe, and they spent about $700,000 in between 1989 and 1993 when the hammer finally fell. Uh, Eric pursued his dream of being a pro tennis player by starting a tennis coaching business and actually financing his own little semi-pro tour all over uh, all over Europe and into Israel. So they were living it up on their parents' money. Meanwhile, detectives were, after having the whole mob connection come up kind of dry, they started taking a second look at the two brothers kind of hammering in on Eric, the youngest, and who they thought might be the most vulnerable to actually confessing what they did. They actually kind of forced or intimidated a couple of his high school friends to try to extract a confession from him. And they wired them up. They had him hang out with Eric. And after drinking and 
hanging out and eating, they would casually ask him things like, did you kill your parents? Do you know who killed your parents? Who do you think killed your parents? And Eric would always answer, no, I didn't kill my parents. No, I don't know who killed my parents. And I, I, I have no idea why you're even asking me that. So Eric did kind of maintain his innocence to his friends. However, Eric was also going through uh, counseling with a local psychologist by the name of Jerome Ozeal uh, for the PTSD he had suffered since his parents' murder. And he did confess in a weak moment to Jerome that they had that he and his brother Lyle had been the ones to commit the crime. He felt he was safe in doing that because of, you know, doctor patient confidentiality, but what you don't realize is that doctors are kind of, because of their Hippocratic oath are kind of um bound to conf to let police know about criminal behavior that is confessed as part of a medical exam. I mean, Hippocratic oath that is not prevent you from reporting a crime. Uh, Dr. Ozell did not right away report the crime to the police. Instead, he did um, confess to his significant other what had happened. And she, a uh, Miss Smith, Judalon Smith, did go to the police with it about three days later after older brother Lyle threatened both her and Dr. Ozell because of what they knew. Eric had gone back and, and kind of told him that he slipped up and told what happened. Lyle went and threatened both the psychologist and his girlfriend, and she went to the police, which launched a huge investigation into the brothers. And so Lyle was actually arrested uh, March 8, 1990, and Eric turned himself in three days later. They did not actually go to trial until 1993 because of the argument over the admissibility of those confession tapes. Now, eventually, the California Supreme Court did rule that all of the recorded conversations between Eric, Dr. Ozell, uh, Ozell's girlfriend, and Lyle were admissible because Lyle himself had violated the a confidentiality agreement between patient and doctor when he threatened the doctor. That kind of made all of that admissible, where Lyle was threatening them. And that's the main evidence they went on, because that they did rule that the actual tapes, because most psychological exams are recorded for the doctor's safety and the patient's safety, they did rule that the actual tape where Eric confessed it to the doctor was not admissible, because that was under client-patient confidentiality, but the threats that came later by virtue of Lyle that were recorded were admissible and it was as good as the confession. So that was the big holdup for the trial, but the trial did get underway in 1993. Their defense attorney, Leslie Abraham, in the original trial, which was broadcast on Court TV, like I said, it was one of the originals that gripped the nation put forth the a theory that the boys were not only the victims of physical and psychological abuse at the hands of both their parents who strove for perfection and wanted to push their boys to perfection at no at any cost and also accused Jose of being an abuser and I know I think you know I can't really say what kind of abuse because of the powers that be at YouTube you know <laughs> banning and suppressing those but let's just say they accused him of not so nice things. They accused Jose of being an alcoholic, a drug addict connected with the mob, and Kitty as kind of an enabler that allowed all of it to happen. The trial went on for many, many weeks and eventually ended in a deadlocked jury. With Los Angeles County District Attorney Gil Garcetti announcing that the boys would be retried. Uh, the second trial was not as heavily publicized. In fact, its coverage was kind of suppressed because they did want the ability to give the boys a fair trial, as fair of a trial you can get when you're in the middle of a highly publicized case. But uh, And also the judge, Stanley Weisberg, did not allow any cameras in the courtroom. During the second trial, did he did not uh, allow the defense as much testimony about the sexual abuse claims because... He felt that, that the trial had the first trial had been dominated by that and that it was all on record and there was no need to 
uh, replay all of that. So it was a much abridged trial. Now, I'm not sure about all the legalities around that. I'm, I'm assuming that because it was already on record that that was well within their constitutional rights. I have no doubt that their lawyer, Ms. Abram, Abrams, <coughs> Abramson, would have contested that if it had been a violation of the constitutional right. And whereas in the first trial, both first degree, second degree, and murder and manslaughter, first and second degree, were on the list of possible outcomes of that trial. And the judge really believed that, that is the reason that it ended in a deadlock, in a mistrial. So, in this trial, only first and second degree murder were among the allowable charges. They were not allowing manslaughter in for some reason. But eventually, both Lyle and Eric Menendez were convicted of two counts of first-degree murder in the murder of Jose and Kitty Menendez and of conspiracy to commit murder because it was a plan. Basically, as the testimony and the evidence show, the boys wanted their parents out of their lives for several reasons. One, they felt that they were always letting them down, and two, they just wanted the money. It all comes down to greed. It was agreed between the two boys that Lyle would shoot uh, Jose and that Eric would shoot their mother Kitty. However, Eric chickened out uh, after he saw his father get shot in the back of the head. He kind of panicked and that's what allowed Kitty the time to get up and make a run for the hallway in which Lyle shot her in the leg which brought her down in the hallway and then he finished her off by shooting her in the back, the chest, and the face. So it appeared that Lyle was the trigger man for both of them, even though Eric had full knowledge and was supposed to be participating. So finally, in 1996, remember, this happened in 1989. The murders happened in 1989. In 1996, both brothers were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and then also a sentence to two consecutive 20-year sentences for the conspiracy to commit murder. So they are never getting out of prison. Never getting out of prison. Remember, the death penalty has never really been a thing in California because it's been there and then it's been, you know, removed and then brought back. It, it's kind of been a love-hate relationship with the death penalty. So most of the time in California, it's going to be life without parole. The brothers were sent to different prisons uh, with Lyle sent to a prison in Northern California and uh, Eric being sent to one in Southern California. And it remained that way until th 2018 when Lyle was moved to the same correctional facility in San Diego County that his brother was at, but they were actually housed in different pods for the longest time until the end of 2018 when they were actually allowed to be in the same pod. Uh, supposedly, they burst into tears and hugged each other because it had been 22 years since they had seen each other. And um, they've both been in rehabilitation and educational programs at the prison, and so they're allowed to be in a special pod for people that are participating in active rehabilitation. Partners in a crime uh, in a sensational murder case uh, reunited after decades apart. Eric and Lyle Menendez, who were convicted over 20 years ago in the brutal killings of their parents, they're now in the same federal prison. And ABC's Marcy Gonzalez joins us from L.A. with more on the two brothers who've managed to keep a close bond after all these years. Good morning, Marcy. Good morning, Paul and Dan. That's right. They weren't allowed to talk to each other on the phone, so they communicated through each other's wives. They wrote letters, even played chess by sending their moves back and forth through the mail. And now, after applying to be in the same prison multiple times over the years, that request was finally approved. This morning, the Menendez brothers back under the same roof, reunited in this Southern California prison for the first time in nearly 22 years. Lyle burst into tears. And Eric burst into tears, and they hugged each other for several minutes. They didn't say anything for a few minutes. They just hugged each other. They were both crying. Again, I think by virtue of their popularity, their celebrity, and their wealth. But who am I to say? Both boys uh, have exhausted uh, to date most of their appeals, including a writ of habeas corpus, uh, Lyle did get married in 1996 to his girlfriend, Anna Erickson, at a prison ceremony that was only attended by their attorney and an aunt. 
and uh, but they actually divorced uh, April 1st, 2001, so it was a very short marriage. Uh, Eric married uh, Tammy Ruth Sacoma at Folsom State Prison after a very, very short engagement. Um, they had a very short prison ceremony. They had a Twinkie as a wedding cake and were not allowed a conjugal visit. They've never been allowed a conjugal visit to date. Uh, Tammy has made the rounds on a lot of the talk shows talking about being Mrs. Menendez. Her and Eric have co-written a book calling Mrs. Med uh, calling, uh, called Mrs. Med Menendez. And also another um, part of that was an A&E recent five-part documentary called The Menendez Mur Murders, Eric Tells All, in which Tammy and Eric recount their experiences. So... They're not hurting for money. That those two have gotten rich off of this, uh, off this case. And with that, closes the saga of the Menendez brothers. They do still have some appeals left. We might eventually see them get out of prison, but uh, they've been in prison their entire their entire adult life. They're both in their forties and uh, have never haven't lived outside prison since 1996. So. Anyway, what's your opinion on the Menendez brothers? Were they abused children that took the lives of their abusers, or were they just greedy kids who wanted more money, or are they somewhere in between? Let me know what you think down below. And until next time, keto and crime.